Hello everybody and welcome back to the Dragon's Library. So today I am finally getting to my next book review and it is Murtog, a new fantasy book by Christopher Paolini. It's set in his Inherent Cycle universe and I am so excited to talk about this because the Inherent Cycle is one of my favorite book series growing up. Now, for those of you who are unaware of this series, The Inherent Cycle were a group of fantasy books, four of them to be specific, created by Christopher Paolini. He started the first when he was 15, releasing I think when he was 16. It was one of my childhood staples, a series about a young peasant boy who became a dragon rider and slew an evil king. The series was very successful for its time, and although many derided it as being somewhat derivative of other fantasy works, particularly that of Tolkien, and of the plot resembling a lot of stuff, a lot of people say it's like Tolkien filtered through Star Wars, which honestly I think is kind of a decent description of it, but in general I don't really see that as a problem. A lot of people do, I don't. For those of you who are wondering, Murtog is a direct sequel to The Inherent Cycle. Not in the sense that it's continuing on the plot of the main character, but it's continuing on a plot of a side character in the immediate fallout of the Empire's collapse, Galvatorx's fall, the Varden taking over, Aragon leaving. Now I'm not going to explain exactly what happened at the end of The Inherent Cycle, because I just don't have the time. The books are long, there are four of them, and quite frankly, I would, I've tried to do it like four times now, and each time I try and explain it, I just don't feel like I get a good description. So, I'm going to be continuing this review with an understanding that you have at least a passing understanding of the Inherent Cycle, and that you will be okay with any spoilers, because there is no way to discuss the plot of Murtaugh, at least in my opinion, without going into spoilers on the Inherent Cycle and Aragon. Just a warning, we're all good. Now, Murtaugh starts out in the year or two after the Varden defeated Galvatorix and Aragon has left Allegasia. For those of you who are unaware of Murtaugh or just need a refresher or didn't read the first books and want to watch this video anyway for some reason, Murtaugh was the son of one of Galvatorix's 13 riders who had joined with him and killed the other riders before Aragon came back. By the time Aragon takes place, all the Forsworn, as they're called, were already dead. But the first of the Forsworn, Morzan, had a son with Aragon's mother, actually, who ran away got, after she got pregnant with his mortal enemy's son, Brom, who was Aragorn's teacher for the first book. That's a long, complicated family drama, but it does sort of matter for Murtaugh's character because he discovers that they were half-siblings after he got kidnapped. Basically, Morzan was a true believer in Galvatorx for a bit, even if he thought his father was an asshole, but he ran away after he realized that Galvatorx was a sociopath. He lost his only friend and mentor during their escape and joined up with Brom and Aragon shortly before Brom dies in the first book. He eventually joins with Aragon and goes with Saphir and him to the Vard. And the Vardin are distrustful because he's revealed to be Morzan's son. You know, son of the guy who helped Galvatorx butcher the riders and into the Golden Age. Not the best person, but the Vardin take him in. Unfortunately, at the beginning of the second book, while on a mission with the Vardin's leaders, he's believed to have been killed, but is essentially secreted away by some spies to Galvatorix, and one of the three remaining dragon eggs, Saphira was the first one, she bonded with Aragon. The second, Thorn, hatches and bonds with Murtaugh. Galvatorix then breaks into their minds, rips out their true names. Galvatorix used the true names of Thorn and Murtaugh to put them under his control, and they acted as a sort of secondary opposition to both Aragon and the Varden across the remaining three books. Now, after the war, it made Murtaugh a traitor twice over. He had betrayed the Varden to everyone's eyes, aside from a handful of her leadership who, know was, who knew what happened to him. And even to them, he had gone out of his way to be vicious sometimes because he felt bitter about his situation. This is complicated even further by a romantic relationship he had with Nazuada, the leader of the Varden and eventual new queen. Back in book one, it's complicated. Anyway, with all that out of the way, Murtaugh got a warning from one of the Endurni, the Heart of Hearts, dragons surviving in crystals kind of thing at the end of the last book, and he went on a mission to figure out what it meant. They're talking about how these places with sulfuric gas and blackened earth do not go there for some evil lurks beneath or whatever. And Murtaugh is like, all right, I am i can't be of help to Nazawa in the capital. I can't have a nice life, but me and Thorn, we're going to go off. We're going to make sure that this peace is going to stay there because we can't trust anyone else around us. We can at least do this on our own for our friends. He's still bitter about Aragon because Aragon basically got the life he always wanted. You know, his mother cared enough about Aragon to save him, but why not Murtaugh? And there's this frustration in Murtaugh that had always been present in the first few books, but we get to see that as he goes on this quest to figure out about this strange cult that seems to infiltrated the new growing ki human kingdoms. It's actually really interesting because I personally had thought he had gotten over the whole Aragon is his half-brother thing, but Murtaugh never really got over that. He's still very bitter that his mother, who was the only person he believed cared about her, him, 
loved an, the other child enough to get him out of danger, but didn't save Murtaugh. Now, it's clear that she was trying to try to get Murtaugh, but she died in childbirth. She never got a chance to go back for him. Not truly. She died in the with the healers. And it's sad. Yeah, it's really, really tragic for him. He essentially had the all the shit happen to him. And then Thorn hatched for him, and they got enslaved again, and this time he couldn't even protect the dragon he was bonded to. So as they're going on this journey, facing off with traitors and just hiding hidden places in the world, they finally eventually find about, about this witch. Uh, eventually they're real to like a half-elven witch who leads this cult over this weird piece of earth with weird dreaming stuff going on, and some of that horror element lurking deep just underneath the surface. You know, they're all acting very cultish, very weird, talking about the prophesized days and all that. What's really interesting about this book is as they're doing this, well, quite frankly, after Aragon beat Galvatorix, Galvatorix essentially took the dead spirits of the dragons and used them to fuel his magic. He had the name of the ancient language. He was a powerhouse. Like, trying to escalate threat at that point in a series is pointless. That's one of the reasons I think the series has gone on such a long hiatus, personally. Partially, probably because Christopher Lee felt like he told his story, and also because where do you go from there? That's a big question with some of these fantasy series. They always try and one-up themselves. Murtaugh does a very clever thing. See, Murtaugh was dangerous, but he had the Endurani back then during the war, which he gave to Aragon so he could, they could be healed. He had Galvatorix's armies and resources. Now he's on his own, scrappy. Galvatorix did not train him as an actual writer. He had a few months to work with Murtaugh. And whereas Aragon got multiple years to train, Galvatorix tortured and then rushed Murtaugh through early training. Thorn isn't even supposed to be a full-grown dragon yet. He's still supposed to be kind of a whelp. But Galvatorx used magic to grow him larger just so he'd be able to fight Saphira. He, Murtaugh was trained to be a blunt instrument, good at doing certain things. The magic he was taught was specifically for combat. It wasn't supposed to be able to spy, or heal, or, you know, defend himself against Galvatorx. So when Murtaugh finds a book while he's infiltrating this magician's lair, and it's like full of ancient language words, and he's like, holy shit, I need this. <laughs> Whereas Aragorn would look at that, maybe find like one new word and be like, eh, the elves have had better ones. Next. Because Murtaugh needs everything he can get. He doesn't have infinite resources. Even when you had the Varden, who were like a rebel group, they were still an established rebel group that had been doing this for years. Murtaugh's on his own with nothing but him and Thorn and what connections he can scavenge from his two lives that he's had. And I really like this. It gives Murtaugh the sense that you can make the enemy powerful. And this witch is powerful. She casts a bunch of like wordless magic stuff to make them immune to spells. She has all these tricks and ancient powers that she dresses up. But the thing is, in a fight against her and Galvatorix, I know for a fact Galvatorix would win. If they just went head to head, Galvatorix would win flatten her. The only reason she was alive is because she had been scheming against the riders even before Galvatorix took power. She even admits that she found Galvatorix in his madness and coaxed him back to health and sent him off because the riders were getting a little too close to her area and she wanted to see if one of their own could put them down. Because, again, she could not do it on her own. That's the thing. The story puts a lot of points on how these people, these cultists, could not match the power levels of the previous, even if they were scary and powerful. Murtaugh goes through a lot in this book. He has to confront his past of losing people and constantly being tossed from one group to the next, one cage to the next, one master to the next. Finally decides to stand up and free himself in a way that, the thing is with Galvatorix, Murtaugh did not get to kill Galvatorix. Galvatorix was the man who had turned his father into a monster, who had allowed Morzan to torment him, who had shown, tried to corrupt Murtaugh from a young age only for Murtaugh to see through and hunt him to the end of the earth and then bring him back just so he could be tortured and enslaved again. And Murtaugh didn't get to kill him. Aragorn made Galvatorix feel all the pain he had ever inflicted on others, driving him mad, causing him to commit magic suicide in order to make him kill himself. Murtaugh never got that closure. But this time, when he gets controlled and manipulated, he's not only able to fight back and free himself on his own without Nazuada, without Aragon, with just him and Thorn, he is also able to finally get some closure for once by killing and dealing with this threat. In the process of this, he also meets us Urgle, who's another kidnapped magician that the cult's trying to convert, and he realizes both through his talks and also because he thinks, how stupid was I to do this alone, that he cannot stay on his own here. The main thing is, if Murtaugh had just asked for help too, he also could have avoided this whole situation. There's also a very cool Lovecraftian horror element that comes at the end with what the cult's worshipping, and it's kind of real but kind of not, which is one of the cool things about the Inherent Cycle as a whole. The dwarves had that strange entity they summoned during the ritual, which Aragon and the elves are like, yeah, we have no clue what this is. Uh, we thought we knew everything. We don't. 
there's this undercurrent that the magic in Aragon is a very hard system, but it's a very soft system actually. It just pretends to be a hard system with the words and magic. But wordless magic can do some crazy shit that nobody really understands. So um, I really enjoyed this book in case you didn't get it lost. I thought it was a good exploration of Murtaugh as a character and really gave a lot of closure to his arc because he was a side story in the last book with Nazuada in, the, in chains in Galvatore's basement. But this time he finally got the room to breathe and he finally at the end comes to terms with this shit. He's not, you know, he's not healed. He's not fixed after this experience. Quite frankly, he's in a lot of pain, but he finally goes back to Nazuada, tells her everything, explains himself, and when she asks him to stay this time, he decides to stay, get some help, and even go recounsel with Aragon off screen. And I'm just like, yes, please give this boy a hug, a blanket, <laughs> and a shoulder to cry on, because quite frankly, his angst is reaching critical mass. <laughs> So, I really like this. 9 out of 10. Great book. I'm really glad Chris Rubhalini is back. Moving on from there, we have the announcements. Now, I'm not going to be able to go see any movies in the coming week. However, I do have some reviews planned. I'm going to be reviewing The Iron Flame. That is a new book. It's the sequel to The Fourth Wing. Really looking forward to that. And I am going to be seeing about doing a review for another game or something similar. Or perhaps the Attack on Titan review I keep thinking about doing but keep kind of pushing off to the side. We'll see. Moving on from there, we have the end card. Go click on the subscribe or go to my channel and subscribe. There's a video of YouTube trends and a playlist of all the stuff I've done this year. Click on both of those. Seriously, it would mean a lot. And I will see you all next time. Bye!